Our first keynote speaker, Peter Dahlgren, is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Communication and Media, Lund University in Sweden. Having been educated in the US, he returned to Sweden in 1980 and stayed there for most of the time ever since. His work broadly focuses on media and democracy from the horizons of late modern social and cultural theory. More specifically, he often addresses the theme of democratic participation, in particular in relation to the digital media. Most recently, he has focused on the web, social media, and political participation, looking at how the web, combined with other factors, can facilitate or hinder civic identities and engagement, especially among young people. He is active in European academic networks and has also been a visiting scholar at several universities, including, and here I need to apologize for my French pronunciation, Université de Paris 2 and Paris 3, Université de, de Grenoble, and the Anneberg School of Communication, University of Pen Pennsylvania. Along with journal articles and book chapters, his recent publications include The Political Web, Media and Political Engagement, and the co-edited co volume Young People, ICTs and Democracy. Today he will address the topic Media and Civic Cultures in Western Lay Democracy, the New Subjectivity and Sociality, looking at historical transformation of democracy in the West and the emergence of lay democracy with new forms of civic engagement, problems of governance and media serving to foster new model modes of subjectivity and sociality. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome our first keynote speaker, Peter Dahlgren. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, let me begin by expressing my sincere thanks for the, uh, to the organizing committee for the invitation and for, for bringing me here to this exciting event. Uh, what a program. Um, I woke up this morning to the news. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, now, th this turn of events has many ramifications that we could talk about at length, uh, and I'm sure we will, but I, I guess I, I will stick to my presentation. Um, however, I, I think what happened in the United States uh, yesterday uh, signifies a historical rupture uh, and means that late democracy, which I'll be talking a little bit about, is, has become a whole lot later um, and considerably darker. Um, and this adds uh, unfortunate relevance to some of my remarks here today. <clears throat> but even before that news hit us, uh, my presentation here reflects uh, worry, anger, uh, but also an obstinate optimism, uh, a vision of better societal arrangements. Uh, that vision now might be uh, a bit harder to maintain. It will probably require longer time frames. Uh, but I feel we need this vision uh, for the sake of democracy and for the sake of our mental health. Uh, now, to talk of late democracy suggests some historical changes underway. Uh, in a, we're in a qualitative different situation. And um, and many of the things here that I have to say here will be uh, familiar to some of you, and some of the things will be familiar to many of you. But uh, my hope is that this, what is a sort of a panoramic overview inspired by many, uh, the work of many colleagues, uh, will help highlight uh, some key features and uh, that raise questions that we might, well, we already are in the process of trying to answer, but maybe hopefully will help us uh, move along on, on that track. So, on we go. 
So the, the idea of, of late democracy, uh, as I said, is po it points towards tendencies. It's not a uh, rigorous theory. Uh, as in the recent discussions around the concept of uh, mediatization, uh, I see it as a sensitizing uh, notion. I mean, we might talk about early, mid, late democracy, I don't know. But uh, <clears throat> there's, the point is there, there are no final cemented realities. The social world is always evolving. Uh, yet there's something going on here. Something has uh, transformed itself. Something, there's something new going on here that we have to deal with. And, uh, it's a mixture of uh, good and bad news, and uh, <clears throat> having to do with uh, changes in democracy, media, and civic engagement. Now, <clears throat> my presentation here, I, I want to talk a bit about, just shortly, about um, late democracy. I want to anchor some of these issues around democracy in, in the notion of neoliberalism, and that's kind of a scene-setting portion. Now, the section on the media landscape uh, with the themes of subjectivity, sociality, uh, and uh, I think cognition also I have, I have in there, uh, I'll be passing through that rather quickly. This is a lot of the exciting work that's being done now. I'll just highlight a few things. I have too many slides, but I'll hi highlight a few things to illustrate my points. And then I want to land on uh, the final part of the discussion uh, on, on theory and uh, research. <clears throat> it's always difficult to situate, situate the present in a historical uh, framework. And uh, we, we see that democracy historically has passed through a number of transformations. And uh, if we want to, if, if pressed to say something about, well, when does, did late democracy begin, begin to emerge, I guess I would point to uh, the 70s, although that can be... Uh, discussed. But I, I feel the idea offers a lens through which to view uh, civic cultures, uh, engagement, uh, and political participation. And it also suggests that we perhaps have to start rethinking some of the standard notions we hold in regard to democracy. And uh, it also suggests that there's something urgent here. We, we need to uh, really focus attention. <clears throat> Now, um, democracy, of course, uh, as a historical evolution, is driven by many factors. Uh, I would emphasize this reconfiguration between power elites, media journalism, and citizens in participation. Uh, one of the upsides of late democracy is that the traditional filtering that uh, elites have done in, in, the, um, in media spaces uh, is in decline, allowing for more voices, civic voices, uh, allowing for newer su subjectivities, and uh, f allowing for new ways of doing democracy. <clears throat> and at the same time, we find that democracy is torn by a lot of malfunctions. Uh, there's problems of, of governance. The institutions aren't working. Uh, not least the, uh, the emergence of uh, or what I call the onslaught of an unaccountable neoliberal power. Globally, uh, research from uh, like Freedom House, these other institutions that do this kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of statistical quantitative profiles indicate that uh, the qualitative decline of democratic practices is very, very uh, uh, cogent in recent decades. Democracy, democracy is on the defensive. In some places, it, it's in retreat. In authoritarian settings, it's being eclipsed. And uh, in some parts of, in some, among some younger democracies, we're seeing what's called authoritarian nostalgia. Uh, the messiness of democracy evokes a longing for tidier, more stable times, uh, even at the price of freedom. And uh, and within the media, uh, the logics and use patterns can, uh, while they can empower, they also can contain, constrain and deflect uh, participation. And uh, 
I'll go quickly here. We, we, we're, we're on fairly familiar ground here with uh, uh, the, the difficulties facing traditional political parties, uh, professional journalism, so forth. Among citizens, uh, <clears throat> trust is in decline, as is confidence and legitimacy in the system, growing apathy, cynicism. Uh, we're seeing rage and mobilization uh, as well in response to this. Uh, civic responses, uh, <clears throat> the seemingly increasing failures and indifference and corruption of elites in many areas uh, are worsening the situation, but these are be becoming more visible, again, through the declining lack of control on their part. And uh, it's being amplified not least by uh, on online communications. And <clears throat> we're seeing also increased polarizations declines in what we call you know, reason, deliberation, and so forth. Public debate increasingly becoming uh, pie-throwing, uh, no shared premises. Oh, thank you. And we're seeing a democratic malaise not experienced since the 1930s. Uh, did I skip something here? And certainly, one of the responses here is, is uh, what we're seeing in Europe and in the United States and elsewhere, Philippines, uh, what was known as populism. And the populism, uh, much can be said about it, uh, but I think it's important to underscore that often it is uh, motivated by what can be seen as legitimate grievances. Uh, people having, groups of people feeling that they're being uh, ignored politically, they're economically uh, being disfavored, uh, perhaps culturally denigrated, uh, amounting rage. Anger then is mobilized and redirected, scapegoating and so forth, and we're familiar with all the racist and uh, uh, xenophobic rhetoric. But I think it's important to keep in mind that behind that can often lie uh, legitimate uh, grievances which signify a failure of liberal democracy to be inclusive. We're seeing trans re-transformations of, of the public spheres. Again, familiar here with uh, what is happening in, in journalism, uh, the, the fu increasingly fuzzy boundary between journalism and non-journalism, the rise of citizen journalism, uh, <clears throat> new forms of political expression through the net, uh, and uh, in an environment where pluralism and cacophony often are uh, <laughs> overwhelming. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, we see the public sphere blurring with entertainment and consumption. And <clears throat> these tensions, these pulls and, and, and pushes uh, are having impacts also on the dynamics of uh, democracy. Also, <clears throat> His, throughout history, the boundaries between what is public and what is private occasionally are re renegotiated, redefined, and that's going on very dramatically uh, today. And we're seeing how concerns that were previously defined as being part of the uh, uh, personal, the domestic arena have become now political with, with new kinds of issues uh, arising, transforming w what in fact is politics and what is the public. And uh, we're familiar with these uh, issues around identity, sexuality, values, aesthetics, and so forth. And uh, this has brought into the political arena huge areas uh, that are both contested and uh, quite ambiguous. And, Stephen Coleman, I think, sums up the situation rather well. He says, when democracy is experienced as a political system in which most people feel removed and distant from making decisions, and where political uh, institutions are rarely trusted, public debate is overwhelmingly shrill, partisan, pugnacious, and non-deliberative, and the actively engaged are unrepre unrepresentative of the public at large, there is something seriously awry the democratic malaise. Now, in regard to uh, neoliberalism, uh, we can see that historically, uh, 
capitalist economic systems and the ideals of democracy have had uh, some, sometimes difficulty meshing and working together. Now, with neoliberalism, uh, and there's a lot been written on this, um, here I'm quoting from David Harvey, uh, a, a post-Keynesian phase of capitalism with uh, again, looking back, say, around the 1970s, with altered relationship between state capital and labor. And neoliberalism is a global, if not homogenous, phenomena. And, uh, of course, accentuates the dynamics of the market, the importance of private property, and so forth. And uh, I would just underscore that the, these critiques are not necessarily anti-market, per se. Uh, what they're questioning is the role, the place, and the control of markets in relationship to uh, democratic norms. <clears throat> and, um, well, the political economy, we, we know quite a bit now about uh, uh, the globalization, the increasing uh, uh, intensified inequality, uh, which has its impact on the quality and character of, of democracy. What I would emphasize here, uh, what's perhaps harder to get a grasp on, is what I would call the sociologic perspective on uh, neoliberalism, a form of what Whitney Brown calls hegemonic normative rationality. It imposes economism, market models, on all your areas of human life, transforming that which is specifically political uh, uh, in, in regard to democracy into uh, economic elements. And it, as she says, it's quietly, quietly undoing the basic elements of democracy, the vocabularies, principles of justice, political cultures, habits of citizenship, and democratic imaginaries. And uh, one could say that within the established democracies, this <laughs> neoliberal development is the single most uh, serious threat to its uh, uh, existence. Of course, in other circumstances, authoritarian regimes and so forth pose other kinds of threats. And it's a kind of soft power uh, in place by hegemonic discourses and practices, but as we've seen historically, hard power can be used where, where necessary. Um, now, in regard to neoliberalism, uh, Sean Phelan, a, a colleague in New, New Zealand, as about as far away from us on the planet as you can go without leaving it, um, as a media researcher, I want to avoid slipping into a critical pessimism. And as a critical interpretive researcher, I want to avoid speaking over agents' own self-interpretations of the world. I want to critically understand neoliberal media representations, not simply disparage them because they are neoliberal. Um, and, and I think this is also a good sort of sensitizing attitude instead of just being categor categorically dismissive. The, the, the challenge is to understand more, uh, precisely what, what is going on and uh, to avoid what we call totalizing narratives and reductionist forms of analysis. And uh, again, to remind ourselves that we should focus on the, the political, uh, political agency, democratic agency, which has not yet been eclipsed. Now, here I'm going to go ra rather quickly uh, certainly uh, the market logic has, creates its problems also for uh, the, the internet and social media which are uh, shaped and run by, by pri private corporations with a concentration much more pronounced than in the age of the older mass media. But moving to civic cultures, um, which uh, I see as uh, the taken for granted resources that facilitate participation. And these involve knowledge, values, trust, practices, and identities. Uh, they're impacted on by power relations, they're shaped by the media. Uh, and as the media are evolving in late modernity, late democracy, so are uh, uh, the shape and forms of, of civic cultures. And uh, there's, there's much in motion here. And this is, again, invites rethinking. Uh, and 
not least in regards to, for example, subjectivity, civic subjectivity. Uh, new structures of feeling are emerging, uh, to quote Raymond Williams. Uh, new paths to identity, new character structure of the age, perhaps even, to cite old C. Wright Mills. Uh, and we're still grappling with these kinds of you know, generational shifts and uh, there are theories here which, which are trying to find emergence. And I mean, for me, I think it's really startling when I think that people born, say, I don't know, I, I take the somewhat arbitrary year of 1990, people born <clears throat> since then will have no own experience of the pre-digital age. And I, I'm concerned about that because much of, say, the work that I, we, I think m many of us do is predicated on some kind of a comparative reference point between uh, the digital, the pre-digital, what is it that's changing? Well, when that reference point is lost, uh, what will happen to our analytic capacities? <clears throat> um, in, in, in the media landscape, uh, discourses are shaping, reshaping uh, subjectivity and identities. Uh, in terms of sociality, uh, with the web the, uh, and social media so anchored in our everyday lives, people in their political use of the, these media approach them in the same way uh, that they use them in non-political ways, uh, for good and, and, and bad. Um, so notions of or practices of self-presentation, disclosure, performance, there's a lot of affability and so forth, and a lot of sharing, collaboration, and, and this is, uh, this facilitates civic communication, the horizontal patterns of, of communications is, is certainly an encouraging part, the, the sociality of, uh, 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 that these media foster. But where there are, so, where there, where there uh, are, I forgot the R, social media, there is politics, to quote another colleague. Uh, the political ar arises quite readily now. And I think this is a historically uh, interesting pr uh, new situation that the political and everyday life come so close together, can merge so readily. Um, now, <clears throat> of course, these difficulties emerge here also uh, with political networking, which builds on trust, but trust, as we know, is fragile. And for the sense of security, and I suppose one can argue it's, it's only human, uh, is a lot of researchers have been pointing to what's called the, the discursive cocoons, the public circles, the retreat to these smaller groupings. Now, I, I, I would strongly argue that these do serve a democratic purpose. They f help facilitate facilitate uh, collective identity, uh, they help form, uh, say, political horizons uh, and strategies and so forth. Uh, yet they can become restrictive and tolerant. Citizens' capacity for argument, for carrying on arguments. Uh, there's serious concern among researchers that this is atrophying. Uh, and the enclaves are reinforced by the algor algorithmic logics uh, that reinforce and feed established patterns of media usage. So you have this kind of dynamic uh, uh, which is reinforcing it. Now, leading to, as uh, Zizi Papaturizzi in the US has written about, uh, that online political activity can readily become a privatized habitus, a uh, personal dig digital zone, uh, a comfort zone. Now, uh, this creates new modes of civic agency with uh, uh, unfortunate consumerist inflections. Now, uh, let me go qu look quickly here. Uh, the problem of <clears throat> efficacy, it's, the social media allow us to express ourselves, and that's so important for democracy. Um, research has shown, though, that most political talk on social media does not lead beyond the talk itself. Now, I'm not disparaging the importance of talk, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to underscore here is the problem of efficacy of too much net-based political activity. Uh, there's a 
Um, a, uh, an inability to go beyond uh, the bounds of the, uh, the, the network setting. And uh, I think democracy and, and civic culture suffer for this. And of course, we're, something else has happened, another transformation late democracy. The, the, the net, which originally was so promising in its openness, its uh, friendliness, has changed. There's today a lot of deception, bullying, harass, harassment, lynch mobs. And this is, this is difficult to regulate. Uh, the net has become a dangerous place increasingly uh, for a variety of reasons. Now, <clears throat> let me just quickly say that uh, there are theories from the humanities, for example, that are addressing the larger historical transformations of, uh, of cognitive activity in, in the wake of the, the digital environment. And uh, <clears throat> these transitions uh, are still uh, the point of suggestiveness. I mean, they haven't been f fully investigated yet. But I, I think it's, it, we're seeing traces of it. I think we can track some of these changes. Um, the fundamental transition from alphabetical foundation of knowledge to a digital one. Uh, the screen bias towards visual representation, shorter texts. Uh, we, we gain in speed and, and information, but uh, what about longer texts? What, what are the implications here for <laughs> rationality, for deliberation, key features of democracy? Do we need to redefine democracy in the light of altered cognitive capacities? And uh, <clears throat> something uh, also uh, in, in terms of the changes in terms of knowledge. Uh, Lev Manovich calls the computer a metamedium, one of a permanent extendability, ca capable of translating just about everything into data. So old analog materials can be computerized and transformed. So what in this software epistemology, uh, it raises questions of what is knowledge? How do we approach it? Approach it? Uh, and you know, artificial intelligence, I mean, it, it goes on. The, uh, these changes are, of course, significant for our lives generally, but I think they have particular pertinence if we're going to understand democracy and the communication that uh, uh, embodies it. And a lot over the last few decades has been written about uh, communication, rationality, uh, and affect, emotions, and so forth. And uh, we need affect and emotions to engage, and yet we can see how these, this easily tips over. Uh, the unconscious is a uh, uh, a slippery sector of our psyche and uh, can be triggered and mobilized uh, in sometimes very unfortunate ways. Uh, how we deal with the in info glut, as Mark Andreevich calls it, uh, how, we dealing, how we deal with speed, what this means for our knowledge, what this means for our capacity to understand. Uh, we've this is a line of uh, concern that we can trace back, you know, even to the television age of uh, radio and sound bites and so forth. But it's accelerating. <clears throat> Let's see. All right. Let, let me uh, sort of come into the home stretch here. In, in trying to uh, specify the dilemmas of late democracy and uh, just offer some quick glimpses of some of the transformations that are going on in the media landscape in terms of uh, uh, subjectivity, sociality, and, and cognition. Uh, we're, we're, we're facing terrain which is partially known and partially not quite under control, still, uh, still partly unknown. And <clears throat> In terms of democracy, I, th I think it's 
been encouraging that we've, uh, researchers have uh, emphasized uh, how um, protest and, and resistance has, has emerged and so forth. But can we go beyond that? Can the net be used for embodying a deeper uh, kind of democracy? Uh, now, uh, let me see. So what I'm suggesting here, uh, trying to pull some of this together here, is that uh, we need more and not less theory. The advent of the algorithmic uh, logic has in some corners resulted in a uh, sense that we don't need theory anymore. The truth is in the data. I mean, what, what can theory tell us? Now, <clears throat> in my view, what we have here is a form of what we could call digital positivism. And I think it's also important to what we mean by theory. Um, we're not talking about necessarily in a sense of something that to be tested, be true, prove, proven true or false. For most of our work, theory is the intellectual and conceptual scaffolding. It, it informs, it guides, it helps us interpret, helps us select and, and, and make sense of, of uh, materials. Uh, and as I thumb, th thumb through the journals, I'm wondering, is theory being marginalized, ghettoized, in favor of uh, these kinds of uh, more qu quick, quantitative, empiric results? Um, I think with the, um, excuse me. With media theory, uh, which has been renovated in a way in, in, the, in the digital age, uh, and the debates around media, uh, internet and democracy, there's been tendencies to make big pronouncements of what media can and can't do, uh, what, uh, what, the social, what social media are or not, the kind of essentialist arguments. And I think we should be careful with that uh, and uh, follow Frederick Jameson's motto, always contextualize. Uh, what is the context of use? What is the context of uh, uh, where this is being uh, acted upon by, by citizens? What, what is the setting in, in which people are using it for their own purposes. Uh, this is where I think we will find more of the, the truth of um, uh, the, the character of social media. I think we also need to step back from some of the concepts that we so readily uh, throw around, even democracy. Let's keep in mind that democracy is a contested uh, concept. It's multivalent, means different things to, in, in political philosophy. There's lots of debates in the, in the world. Ac uh, existing democracies have lots of different character. Uh, and I think we should ask what aspects, dimensions of democracy are salient in a particular uh, setting? Uh, does the adjective late help us at all? Maybe not. But I think we have to see that uh, what we mean by democratic is being challenged by the developments of, of digital media. Even participation, what forms, what degrees uh, of encounter with power relations do we, uh, should we demand of participation? Uh, how how can, uh, can we gauge different modes for different settings? Networks, uh, we're all very enthusiastic about networks, but they aren't inherently progressive. Uh, Who's networking how? And what, what are the, there are negative consequences of networks, uh, uh, exclusions, centralizations, and so forth. These dynamics, I think, should be explored further. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, the, uh, the techno-celebratory discourses has to be uh, countered. Now, in talking about theory, I, I think um, that Theory as a form of intellectual uh, toolboxes, I think the humanities have a lot to offer us, which uh, I think many of us in social science seem to forget. Um, so the digital revolution is impacting not just on democracy, but also on, on how we live more generally. Uh, 
what is happening to the notion of friends in the age of social, so, social bots, uh, as uh, uh, Maria Bakajeva and others have written about? Uh, the notion of the human is evolving. Our bodies are becoming more tech integrated. There are values, ethics. Uh, many of our values and ethics are being further dislodged from perceived uncertainties. Democracy is not just systems, but also sociocultural ways of life. And I think here inspiration from the humanities can help with their perspectives on uh, ethics, history, aesthetics, uh, putting things in context which perhaps some of us in our social science uh, activities uh, will miss. So for example, uh, we, we tend to have a, uh, we operate with taking for granted notions of, of the subject, but let us recall that there are many, many versions of the subject, the self. Which one are we choosing and why? What are the consequences of it? Uh, do we see, uh, is it a social constructionist one? If so, what do we do with the unconscious? Uh, the post-structural take of contingent su subjects, uh, can we, should we integrate that? Uh, I think this kind of reflection is also important at, at the level of uh, theory. And certainly power relations, uh, referring to what I was say, saying earlier about the dilemmas of late democracy and uh, the, uh, the onslaught of, of uh, neoliberalism, uh, power is, is an extrable dimension of social relations. Uh, and we, uh, we need it and so forth. But at times it tips over. Uh, domination, exploitation uh, begin to emerge uh, in illegitimate ways. Problematizing power relations uh, is, is the work of critique, the tradition of, of critical theory. And it is evolving, but I think needs a uh, regeneration in terms of encountering uh, what is going on today. We're seeing this on some fronts, but uh, I think it's, uh, from my view, unfortunately a bit too marginalized. Now, um, so just to wind up here, um, some possible critical agendas uh, in dealing with democratic de deficiencies. Instead of asking, uh, does the internet do this or do that for democracy? Uh, Stephen Coleman suggests, why not ask, what dilemmas does democ democracy face? How might the net help? How might the net help facilitate uh, civic culture, civic engagement. Um, how can he argues make? How can we help see uh, using that to make representation more meaningful, responsive, accountable in late democracy? How to lessen the distance between citizens and democratic institutions, which is causing so many of the problems that we're seeing. And uh, and here I think you know we have to be, think more uh, systematically System, systemically, uh, distinguishing what is the difference between a liberatory experience, a liberatory experience of an individual or a group versus what is good for democracy as, as a whole. And enhancing civic efficacy, uh, how to move from, say, talking a lot to act, acting more? How can civic culture's agency and its identities be strengthened? So we need more emphasis on organization, on mobilization, on coordination. How can we reshape the power relations within the dynamics of late democracy uh, in the face of a rapidly changing media landscape shaped by neoliberal corrosion? And I'll, I'll give the last word here to uh, Natalie Fenton in her new book. She says, the challenge to the field of media and communication studies is to actively put politics back into the picture, to reinvigorate critical research that is, that is explanatory, practical, and normative. So, the end. Thank you. Okay, this is better probably now, yes. So do we have a question, comment? Um, 
Is it working? Oh, excellent. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I actually tweeted about it just now. Um, I, Peter here. Hello. I hear you. I don't I'm sorry. I can't be taller. Ah, oh, there. Okay. <coughs> Greetings. Yeah. Um, in the back. I, actually, I just tweeted about it. I 100% agree with you on the need for more theory. My question is, how do we go about it in the um, um, in the, in the neoliberal university, especially in the UK, that instrumentalizes knowledge. And the only knowledge, especially in the media, that is good for, that is good now, is one that finds one a job, a, 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 you know, straight after. You know, how do we go about in the, in the neoliberal university that valorizes, um, um, you know, the NSS, the National Student Survey, and all these things? Thank you. Yeah, uh, sh shall I answer each one? Or it's a lot easier that way, yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, th th thanks for that question. Um, you're right, uh, I, I think here we can see the neoliberal paradigm as it's being applied to universities. What kind of knowledge for what kinds of purposes, uh, alter power relationships within the university and so forth. And uh, so in, in terms of theory, uh, to the extent that it's being marginalized uh, and particularly say, U useful theory that, that can uh, enhance democratic practices and so forth. Uh, the only thing I can say is that, uh, as in many situations, it's a question of resistance. Uh, <clears throat> if it's not on the syllabus, then uh, students, teachers have to form their own working groups. Uh, there's a uh, we still have uh, quite a degree of, of freedom of. of uh, uh, how we operate with, within the academic environment. But uh, I, I think uh, it concerted a self-conscious effort uh, on the part of those who are concerned uh, is the only way it's going to go, come about. It's not going to happen on its own. In fact, that's, I think this, this, the situation in this regard will probably continue to deteriorate. So a, a, a conscious, concerted effort, seeing it as an expression of the political within the context of the university. Okay, do we have another question? Hi, Peter. Philip, Philip Marek here. How are you? Greetings. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to elaborate on your concept of late democracy. Don't you think that we are having, uh, uh, going to the limits of democracy now and uh, maybe we are not in the late democracy but we are in the post-democratic system now? Uh, uh, we've been uh, uh, looking at the evolution of political communication uh, towards to the point that now we are not electing someone for any kind of political program anymore but just for who he is or, or, or even who he is not and we've had, had the same phenomenon in France. So don't we think that it's not late democracy, but maybe some kind of new post-democratic system? We are getting on and we don't really know where we're going, like the Americans, by the way. Um, you know, uh, some days I agree with you. and That's when I feel like crawling on the cover with a bottle of whiskey or something. But, uh, uh, but analytically, I would say, uh, I would still choose late democracy to indicate that we're, we still have remnants of it left. I mean, if we say post-democracy, it's like uh, you know, the train has left the station. And, uh, but I think realistically, there are still uh, democratic possibilities. There are still procedures and institutions. They're weak, they're vulnerable. Uh, they, they sometimes seem to be self-destructing. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's also, I don't know, psychologically, I think, more empowering to think that we're working within the context of a late democracy and it's, the situation is getting desperate, yes. Uh, whereas if uh, we, we call it post-democracy, it's like, you know, we might as well go home. Uh, I think it's also important to keep in mind that uh, the history of modern de democracy, if we go back like two centuries, centuries has been uh, not a steady rise, uh, it's been jagged, but it has been going upwards. And now we've hit, uh, and in the past there have been very dark times. I mean, you can go back to the 
say the 1930s in Europe and so forth. And I think we, we are entering dark times now, but I, I would uh, uh, still retain the idea that it's late, but it is getting later. Some very interesting insights and ideas. Uh, we do have time for one more question and comment. Do we have any? Okay, if not, then Peter, thank you very much for this very interesting keynote. Thank you.